Hello, I've just finished part two of my coastal walk of Great Britain and it began on the 23rd of February 2020 and I picked up from where I'd left off on the 9th of February which was Kings Lynn train station and the plan was to walk across the top of Norfolk into Lincolnshire, around the Wash and up the Lincolnshire coast all the way over the Humber Bridge and across to Hull train station. Um, it ended up being a pretty wild trip and I took some photos and some film footage along the way. So here's what happened. When I left Kings Lynn train station it was pretty overcast. I crossed the river Great Ouse and said goodbye to the town and made my way up to a national nature reserve. It wasn't too long before I was walking high up on the embankments which are referred to in Norfolk as dikes. <laughs> I learned from the locals that it doesn't matter if you're talking about waterways, slopes, mounds or embankments. <laughs> the collective term for the lot is a dike and the wind was up and at one point this was my walking angle. To my right I could just make out the cliffs of Sunny Honey and for the next 12 miles or so it was all dikes all the way to the St Peter Scott Lighthouse. Sir Peter Scott was the son of the famous Antarctic explorer Captain Scott and this board is an interesting read. I'll crop it into sections for you so at the end of this film you can read it if you're interested. Later that day I was met by my mate Derek and he and his wife Angela hosted me for the night. On the 24th of February I left the lighthouse and I was making my way over the top of Norfolk down to the Fosdyke Bridge and it rained solidly all day, uh, but the worst thing was the cold, biting wind. It didn't stop the vegetable pickers, but after about five miles or so up on the dikes, I dipped down into Gedney Dawesmere and took shelter in the church there. Back out on the embankments and roads, it was pretty bleak and at some point I made it into Lincolnshire. But to be honest, the most exciting things I saw all day were uh, a gun cartridge, that thing, an onion, and even more onions. I hadn't seen a soul all day, which made this possible presence sign all the more amusing. I reached the Fosdyke Bridge at about 4.30, where I met my friend, the harp guitarist, Tommy Luce, who kindly put me up for the night. My wife popped in to surprise me with the gift of a new scarf. I was extremely grateful and the following morning it wasn't too long before I went from wearing it like this to this. After miles of grass tracks and mud tracks and a stop at uh, Wibberton Marsh, I headed up the Macmillan Way towards Boston. I could see St Bottles Church, also known as the Boston Stump in the distance but this was my welcome into Boston and it was soon followed by this. To be honest I didn't get a chance to see much of the town as I crossed over the bridge and walked down past St Nicholas Church in Skirbeck. My wife has a family connection with the Pilgrim Fathers so I took a little detour to see this. After that it was all broccoli and cabbage, all the way to Freeston Shore. A friend had given me this cool gadget, and so you can see that it was a fairly long day. At Freeston Shore I met my friend Damien, and this was the start of life in his camper van. I was going to be travelling with Damien for most of my trip up the Lincolnshire coast, and that night at the Bull and Dog pub, the lovely landlady Liv allowed us to stay in her pub car park and we had a great night playing and singing a few tunes she with says, the locals. I have whiskey and a wine of the best And the words I was I also want to thank them for their generous donations to the RNLI. The following morning I set out early from Freeston and I walked past the church and back out onto the embankments. As you can see, the birds were performing well. 
Soon I reached a military air weapons range and before long I was walking past signs like this. It was around lunchtime and I was starving. I wondered what was more important, getting hit by military debris or eating lunch. The sandwich won and I crouched down hoping not to get hit, only to find out later that day that the military range is no longer in use anyway. Uh, the vegetable pickers were working hard out in the rain and as I headed into Gibraltar Point I was looking forward to seeing sand again for the first time since Hunston. But my routing came unstuck as I reached this bridge only to discover that it was double padlocked. Bearing in mind that I was pretty worn out after trekking maybe 16 or 17 miles, there was no way or easy way of getting over. And so I ended up taking a massive detour, which had me arriving into Skegness in the dark. The first stop of the morning was at the RNLI station in Skegness, where I met some of the crew. The guy to my right there is a coxswain at two stations, so I might see him again up at Spurn Head. As I walked along the coast, it was good to be back on sand again, and I also used the English coast path. I'd been hearing about a lady called Beth, who's chosen to do something similar to what I'm doing, only that she decided to do it clockwise. So, I guess we were going to meet at some point. And, well, it happened. Somewhere around a place called Chapel St. Leonard's, we had clocked each other in the distance, and it was great to say hi, and we sat down and had a chat for a while. Her project is called Beth Foot Forward, and I've put a link to her page in the description box below. After passing the North Sea Observatory, I rejoined Damien in the camper, and we stayed right on the shore at uh, Hutoft Banks that night. On the 28th of February, I walked to Saltfleet Bee, which I found out is actually pronounced Solaby. And along the way, I needed a pit stop. And I cannot stress how wonderful the people were at the Corner House Cafe in Sutton-on-Sea. So if you ever get a chance to go there, please tell them once again I said thanks. There was lots of colour along the route to Mablethorpe. After passing the RNLI station, I took in the front and as I walked along the beach, the wind and rain picked up in a big way. After passing this modern art, I headed inland and across the Solaby Dunes. Later on, I rejoined Damien, and he had organised for us to stay at a friend's pub. I spent the first hour there drying off and the pub cat joined me. In the evening, we played a few tunes. The following morning we drove back to Solaby and it was time to say goodbye to Damien and life in the camper van as he had to head back home to Lincoln and um, I'd had a really great time with him and on this leap year day my destination was Cleethorpes. I was back on the embankments for a few hours, I saw geese and black sheep before reaching a well-known spot called Donna Nook. This place is famous for mass seal gatherings these days but uh, unfortunately I'd arrived out of season. After navigating around more coastal erosion, I bumped into this guy. What are the chances of meeting yet another Great Britain coastal walker? <laughs> His name is Quinton Lake, and he is a professional photographer, and he is wild camping his way around the coast. We chatted for a while, and he told some great tales of walking around Scotland. Afterwards, it inspired me to get more creative with my photos, but... After taking pictures uh, like this, I thought uh, I'd better stick to guitar playing. After all the coastal path diversions, I arrived into Cleethorpes just before dark. On the 1st of March, I was up and out super early, 
This is the pier at Cleethorpes, and shortly afterwards I had to head slightly inland, passing uh, Grimsby Football Club, which is actually still in Cleethorpes. By the time I had left Grimsby, though, I found myself walking through a vast industrial landscape. I passed some pretty colossal chemical plants, and I thought I'd better speed up if this is what it was doing to motorbikes around here. Through Immingham, it was pretty much concrete paths all the way, and I would have loved to have popped in here on its country music night. I passed from chemical plants to massive piles of coal, um, shipped in from Poland, I believe. And here is me trying to get creative again. And here is a typical Saturday night prank in Immingham. This is a very dangerous place, and it also seems to be Mercedes Central. Towards the end of the day, I was back out in a less man-made landscape, and my final destination was Gox Hill-on-Sea, where I was collected and kindly hosted by Tim and Sarah. So March the 2nd was the final day of this leg, and back at Gox Hill-on-Sea, it wasn't too long before the Humber Bridge was in sight. This suspension bridge is over two kilometres long, and when it first opened in 1981, it was the longest of its type in the world, and that status lasted for 16 years. It connects North Lincolnshire with the East Riding of Yorkshire, and luckily that day the wind was calm. Soon after, I was on the Trans-Pennine Trail to Hull, and my man Damien drove out to meet up for lunch. He also filmed me heading off the bridge and into Yorkshire. So that concludes part two of my trip from Kings Lynn up to Hull. And I have to say the weather was pretty brutal at times, but all in all, it was a great experience. And I want to thank Derek and Angela and Tommy and Damien and Tim and Sarah for helping me out along the route. Uh, part three begins on the 27th of March. And I thought I'd list the upcoming daily itinerary at the end of this clip. Also along with the, um, the board from the Peter Scott Lighthouse. And if you'd like to read through that, I thought I might play a tune in the background for you. Um, I'd like to thank all of those who have made donations to RNLI so far, along with Help Musicians UK. And if you'd like to make a donation, all of those links are in the description box below too. Okay. So I'll leave you with this piece of mind promise of spring and I'll see you at the end of part three. Thanks for watching.